Hello, hello. Welcome to the evening of day three. For those of you who are here live, we are about to kick off my conversation with Zach Watson. We're going to give a couple of minutes for people to arrive and to show up. And if you are here live, I invite you to just take this moment while we hold the door to see who else is going to be joining us. At the pause, take a deep breath. I, in fact, just posted on my Instagram a photo of me lying down with my head on my meditation cushion, <laughs> taking just a moment to ground and pause as a intention to shift from one part of my day into the into this next last hour. So uh, moments of transition are always great reminders to pause, take a breath, exhale out what came before. Take a deep breath in for being here in the present, not to worry about yet what's coming next. And, you know, last night we talked with Shonda and that was so powerful of the simplicity of pausing and breathing and something that I talk about over and over and over again. For those of you who are in my community, you know, this is um, no surprise that this is a, a foundation to any transformation is connecting to ourselves and our breath. So it's always a great um, reminder. And I invite you as we go through tonight's conversation to be thinking about some questions. We're gonna open it up at the end, the last 10, 15 minutes or so to ask questions to Zach. So you can always pop it in the chat, um, jot, jot it down in your notebook and allow yourself the, the freedom to stay present so you don't forget your question. And um, this is all going to be about relationships. So let's get started. We'll keep welcoming more people in as they join the room. And Zach, please introduce yourself and share, how did you get to be involved in this fair play business? Um, well, I suppose it all started uh, hmm, fair play. So it, it really started uh, back when I was on paternity leave. Uh, I had gotten seriously into TikTok at the beginning of the year in 2021. And then uh, when our daughter was born, uh, I was on paternity leave. And there are a lot of boring moments or there are a lot of moments where um, I just have this child either napping in my lap. Um, this infant, um, she would not sleep in a crib. And so... I would find myself on TikTok, uh, just talking about the challenges of of being a parent. Felt very alone in a lot of ways, but once I started making a couple of videos on like Facebook and then TikTok, uh, realized how not alone I was. And so I kept doing it, kept talking about it, and I discovered quickly that apparently I was I was not the normal when it came to being like an involved dad in those early months, I had three months of paternity leave. And then I say that I manifested the fourth month in my, um, in my appendix. I got appendicitis on the very last day of the third month. So effectively I had that, four months. That, of paternity I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to interrupt real quickly and say this week, I have our episode live on my podcast. And that goes into a whole story about this of manifesting, you know, so if you want to hear the backstory, be sure to check out this week's podcast and you can hear, you know, some more of those details of what went on there. Cause he was a master manifester for getting more time at home. <laughs> yeah. And like a, a huge thing was that I kept telling all my followers, I was like, I'm going to be on paternity for four months. I don't, I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Um, so you know, at, as I did that, as I went through those steps, I recognized that um, it was an I was an atypical example of what paternity leave looks like, of what really early fatherhood looks like. And a lot of people came to me asking for questions. I think they really appreciated the vulnerability that I was sort of sharing with the the challenges that I was going through. I didn't fall in love with our 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 now toddler for at least four months uh if not like six months and i know that a lot of people kind of needed to hear that and felt really validated in the experience they had uh, i think there were 72 stitches of that one video where i talked about it um so i think people started listening to me in that way and then last and i started listening to laura danger uh, if you follow me you probably also follow her um 
He talks a lot about weaponizing competence, mental load, motherhood, and the uh, social dynamics of parenthood. And so I think once once I started listening to her and uh, Abby um, Eckel, uh, it's me, Abby. Um, they both talk about very similar things, and then they both like simultaneously recommended Fair Play. I don't think on purpose. But I was like, wow, I'm hearing this book from two of the people that I really uh, look up to and read the book and um, Fair Play reached out to me after I made like my first video on it. And so I became a Fair Play facilitator back in March. Uh, I've been a special ed teacher for eight years uh, teaching math and uh, I've been in sales the past two years. So it's been interesting as I've been learning how to teach uh, the fair play method there's a lot of simultaneous parts of like when I was a special ed teacher that really helped in teaching that so for those who are new to the fair play method and I imagine that most of our audience who's tuned in are not parents of young kids and so to really you know there's a that's a whole nother you know population of focus but the concept of creating equity in relationship can you define clearly just what that even means you know you talk a lot about mental load emotional load domestic load that often creates inequity and therefore resentment frustration disconnection and how we can begin to even recognize what's going on and then more importantly like what do we do about it so Share some of those basics. Yeah, so, you know, I would say there's three main things that I want to try to cover tonight. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of guys, a uh, couple couples, and the main three things I want to talk about are what consistently come up, uh, the structure that we're typically trying to implement, and some of the tools that that have been really useful for me with uh, with my wife um, and what I'm trying to teach them. So starting sort of with the main things that I often see is um, a lot of people are not having, so one of my first like questions that I ask is how often are those tough conversations that you're having around the dishes and the trash going out? It's really sometimes we think stupid things, but a lot of us are unwilling to have those consistent either weekly or monthly or quarterly check-ins where it's like a, a status update it's like how are we doing uh, if we look at it as a business it's like a it's like an executive leadership meeting like they have those very frequently as mm -hmm. a business with multiple people why aren't we having these in our partnership and i think that's like that's the number one thing that i'm asking no one's having them like yeah of all the people that i've talked to i would say some people, I think uh, we've sort of evolved past that because we've gotten so good at talking in non-planned time about important things that we don't plan them anymore. But can, can I add something in, yeah. into that? Yeah. Um, you know, for those in the chat, feel free to like pop an emoji or do the, the hand raising. Acknowledge, and if you're, if you're watching the replay, just kind of make note, you're not going to be the only one to raise your hand on this. How many of you notice how often the dishwasher becomes the source of relationship issues right I mean like it is ridiculous because when I bring up these little things and yet what, what what these little things represent are unresolved ineffective you know patterns of communication small resentment past issues all the little stuff that you know are, are the paper cuts that cause disrepair in our relationship so you kind of you know in the beginning you mentioned like yeah these are the small things but they're actually the big things because we're still not attending to them mm -hmm. like the yeah, normal totally. normal thing and I, I love how you say you know have an executive leadership meeting you know i, I say the same to my clients of do a weekly check-in no, most people don't even after the best recommendations of why this would be so helpful to strengthen your relationship so I just want to add on that that dishwasher thing seems to get couples every time. Yeah, and it reminds me so much of that scene from the breakup with Vince Vaughn and uh, Jennifer Aniston um, when <clears throat> he's talking about, I got you the lemons. Well, it's not about the lemons. And then it becomes, hey, can you help me with the dishes? 
Hey, I, you know, I just had a hard day at work. Yeah. I had a hard day at work too. Like, I just want the dishes to be done. All right. I'll do the damn dishes. No, no, no. I don't, I don't want you to, I want you to want to do the dishes. So uh, <laughs> I think if they were having those like regular meetings around, like I, the, the end of that conversation turns into, I bust my ass every day so that you don't have to work anymore. Who said I didn't want to work anymore? Like that's, that's something that's interesting to me is my work. Yeah. Um, and there's so many of those, like, you know, in, in the executive leadership meetings, they're having goals for their company. Like, what are the mm -hmm. goals for the home? Do you want to have children? Do you want to buy another house? Do you want to go on a vacation next year? Like, those are important things that need to get brought up in those things and include planning or, or homework so that when you come back to it, people have done things to progress yeah. it. So, so that's the first one is just those reoccurring uh, low emotion conversations. And I think that's the second piece to it. Besides them being like about that topic, the other important part of it is that they're low emotion. So all the time where they're getting things brought up in the moment, like, Hey, I thought you said you were going to do the dishwasher. You were going to empty it this morning. But by the time I got home, it was all piled up to the sink. Like what happened? And in that moment, like it's much harder to have a constructive conversation than when you're low emotion. And I think some people know and understand the idea about it, but they just can't conceive of, well, when we're happy, why would we want to talk about something <laughs> that's hard? Like, why do we want to ruin mm -hmm. a good moment with that? And what I say is, you know, I, so I'm an account manager for a software company. And if I get a call from one of the, one of my uh, customers that likely got an email recently saying their price is going up or something. I know they're going to be pissed. Like I, I don't really want to take that call in the moment. And I kind of, I mean, for me to juggle my job, I have 350 accounts. Like it, I wouldn't get anything done if I just took calls all day like that. So I'll send them an email. Hey, sorry, I can't, I can't talk with you right now. Please schedule a time with me. And the real value in that is we can both come to that conversation emotionally prepared to it. And right. I can, I can double check. All right. What was, what was in the last email that that got sent? Okay. We're going to talk about X, Y, and Z most likely. Um, I need to make, be able to have a couple options for them around here. So do some of the mental work, the mental load around it. And you can have a much more constructive conversation versus one that they're going to be on the offensive. You're going to be on the defensive and you're going to have a constructive conversation. Well, and we also know it, you know, the neuroscience behind that is actually spot on because when the emotions are high and that emotional brain has taken over, it shuts off your executive functioning. So your actual ability to access the tools for the conversation to be effective and productive and stay non-reactive is possible when things are good. Right. And so if you can recognize the narrative, but, you know, I wrote this on what you had said, of why would I want to talk about something hard when we're happy? Well, it's because you actually have the resources to address it, because when you're not happy, you don't have the availability to access the resources. So then you're ending up in another cycle, which is now going to escalate whatever the initial dishwasher issue was about. Right. So, you know, just to validate what you're saying from a neuroscientific standpoint, this makes sense. But many couples come to therapy, we know from science, six years past their issues started, and they tend to come into therapy during crisis, and they leave when the crisis has been done. But guess what, guys? The real work happens outside the crisis. So don't stop <laughs> doing the work just because the crisis has passed, because now you're available to actually deal with it versus being in crisis mode. It's mm. a really good point. I hadn't necessarily considered that. It, it, it's interesting how often, you know, I, I don't think I've really pointed that out to people that you don't have the tools in the moment. And so what a, one of the things I'm going to end with is some of the tools that I'm trying to help people with for when they are in that moment and they need to access tools. Yeah. Um, so, so we'll have to come back to that one towards the end. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that, so I've found that I end up working with a lot of folks that have ADHD, um, I feel like it happens in 75 plus percent of my calls. I personally have been diagnosed with that as well. Um, and one of the things that I've recognized when it comes to, 
it it feels like just kind of executive functioning one on one, um, but people aren't doing the work, and so it doesn't happen because it, it's like so simple, but it's so easy to do, but it's also easy not to do. Um, is creating like a time and a place and a positive reinforcement activity along with that meeting to actually happen. For example, uh, recently I was on a first call with someone. I said, okay, when would be an ideal time, do you think, for you and your partner to talk? Okay, what is it? Is it going to be in the house? Is it going to be at a restaurant? Is it going to be at the library? And they said, at home. Okay, what room and what table and what chairs in the home? And then I could hear like a little bit of annoyance in their voice. Like, why the fuck are they at? Sorry. Do you mind if you I know, swear you, here? You, you, go ahead, swear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, like why, why are they asking me this? And I was like, look, the, the reason is if you can visualize in your head almost exactly what it looks like, there's like, I don't, I'm sure there's statistics behind this, but it's much higher likelihood. I know at least for myself that it's going to happen because it's really easy to say, yeah, we'll do it Sunday night. And then like to think in the moment what that's going to look like takes mental load. And if we're not doing that ahead of time, then it'll likely go back to normal and you'll do nothing. So that, uh, and I say what time and have that time stick with either an event in the day, whether it's dinner uh, or if it's a football game, like after the football game, if it's the kids going down, then, then, um, and then the last part is I, I highly recommend for, for me and Alyssa when we were doing these a couple of years ago, uh, it was pizza and beer was we got to treat ourselves to something because we know we were doing work that we didn't necessarily want to do. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I totally recommend having at least some small dopamine hit, um, have a glass of wine, have a cheese board, have maybe over dinner. If, uh, that doesn't work for everyone. I think they need something a little less formal. Um, you know, have some ice cream, um, get get mm -hmm. a candy bar, like something that's gonna be a little burst, like positive reinforcement. Um, I mean, I guess you could take drugs together. That I haven't actually. I'm just thinking of that now. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that's like the main thing that I'm seeing that people are not implementing nearly enough, and so. I'm going to lead that into some of the structures that we try to create. So that's the first one is creating those mm -hmm. recurring times. And can I just add to that too, that, sure. you know, and I talk a lot about this with clients as well, literally put it in your calendar. We schedule everything else in our lives and we say our partner is the most important person. And yet we don't schedule the time with our partner for these conversations and we think, oh, I don't need to put it on my calendar. I live with them. Of course, I'm going to see them. Of course, we'll get to it. But it, it's qualifying that it's a value to you, that you will put all else aside, and that you are demonstrating the importance of this conversation, your partner, the relationship, to mark it off and to say nothing else is going to interrupt this so that nothing else can, you know, short of a kid getting sick or, right, like, you know, things that just might happen, but we schedule everything. Why not schedule time for this and like literally mark it down? Hmm. Yeah, I think I, I, I think I skipped over that part uh, because I know for myself, when I schedule things in the calendar in our house, they often don't happen because I'm not in look at my calendar mode. I feel like nine to five, I'm like yeah. looking at my calendar. Um, but oftentimes if it's like the weekend or something, it, it doesn't always do it. Um, yeah. So it, I yeah, know so some people some do might not work. Yeah. During that, but yeah, yeah, especially if it's like a paper calendar in your kitchen or something. Sure. Um, so yeah, so that's like that's like the main structure that I totally recommend people do. I probably make a video a week about that. Um, I I couldn't. There's nothing else I could advocate for more than having those low emotion scheduled, or if you're if you have the, that enough of that default time not scheduled. Um, and so the next part is, uh, so I'm definitely biased because I'm a fair play facilitator, but I do recommend people look at, um, it, you know, if, if one of the things that ails your relationship currently is communication, um, getting upset about expectations that one of you set that you haven't communicated all that well about, um, 
implementing the fair play method is a great one. Reading the book together, um, as well as getting the cards, uh, that is a hundred household tasks um, that happen reoccurring. Uh, about 40 of them are valid for if you have children. So no children, you only have 60 to deal with. But the idea is taking on full conception, planning, and execution of a task. So if you have the dish, if you do the dishes, like you're washing them, cleaning them, putting them in the dishwasher, and emptying it and resetting. You're making sure there's soap in the dispenser. You are making sure that the uh, the soap that you use for the dishwasher uh, consistently shows up on the grocery list. I kind of yeah, like a thumbs up going. <laughs> yeah, I just realized the, the Zoom AI has been tracking my hand motions. Um, but yeah, so I, identifying what that fully looks like, and you're going to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I want to just add to it because I actually have, and perhaps I'll send this out in the recording replay tomorrow. I have a PDF of the cards, and you can print them out and cut them up. And even before, you know, it, it's a really valuable exercise for couples to just divvy it up to see what you currently are doing. And there's often a, a very large imbalance of the stack. And that in and of itself is helpful to notice because until we have it named, we may not even know what we're dealing with. And the, the reason I just flipped my hat over for you guys to see, I don't know if it's reverse for you too, but nope, it's a recovering man breath. child. So <laughs> the reason that the reason that I have this hat and this is sort of becoming my brand is that I recognize uh, when you said that about the cards, when we split them up, it turned out we had 64 cards. I owned 20 and she owned the other 48. So as much as I talk about dividing up the workload in the house, I'm still not a fully equal partner. I don't know that we'll ever be fully equal. We're certainly working closer towards equity. Um, and the huge part of what, what I'm working on and, and why people find my message is palatable is because I acknowledge my failures. I acknowledge where I am uh, in a relationship and what I'm working on and consistently trying to share those moments where I'm putting the mental load on her, um, where I'm not showing up the way that I want to uh, in our relationship. So as much as as much as I know a couple people call me a thought leader or an expert, I, I know more importantly, I'm a practitioner. And in a lot of ways, uh, with the guys that I work with, I'm a fourth grader just teaching the third graders. And, and, and in our podcast episode, I get really curious and ask you, so you check out the episode of, but you had to, at some point in your life, have the desire to have that awareness that I'm not being an equitable partner and the desire to do something about it. And as I often say, you can't change what you're not aware of. And even once we're aware of it, it's still a responsibility of, okay, now what are you going to do about it? And, you know, sometimes it's not our fault. We were raised in a certain way where we weren't taught these things. Okay. And you might be in a partnership now in which you are constantly getting in arguments and disconnections over resentment of what's not happening. So at that point, it's not your fault you weren't raised that way. And it is your responsibility to do something about it now if you want to have a healthy partnership moving forward. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not everyone is going to have the desire to say, hey, why the hell would I want to get more cards? I don't, you know, like that's just more work on my part. We can talk about the unicorn space in a little bit. I'm hopefully we'll get to, but there's value in creating, even if it's not perfectly equal, but just showing up with the intention of how can I do this a little bit better? Hmm. And, and that brings me to a good next piece is I think another, when people aren't necessarily ready to grapple with fair play, um, which is, it's a beast. We, we haven't even fully implemented it. Um, we started with looking at what cards are relevant to us. And then we said, okay, who owns 51 or more percent of each of these cards? And so that was when we discovered the 20 to 48, that was where they lay. Yeah, where they lay. So I, I was at 51 or more percent of the 20. And she was at 51 or more percent of the 48. And so rather than switching cards, we said, okay, we recognize there's much more on Alyssa's plate. 
how can we take one of those cards Zach has that's at 51 and bring it to 90 or 100? Um, I think it's a good way to see where you're at. I think as a previously being a special ed teacher and having ninth graders learning math at a fifth grade level, like it's it's a bad idea to try to teach them freshman math when they're operating at a fifth grade level. You really got to meet them where they're at or give them a lot of scaffolding. Uh, and for mm-hmm. that's a sort of an educational buzzword. It's sort of like giving them the the extra help along the way, letting them use the calculator or having a times table next to their desk um, for them to be able to access the information. So um, I, this this might sound bad, but I'm just going to say it. So some of that scaffolding could look like help help me build this list together. I think definitely having the guy attempt to take the mental load off and starting with making their best grocery list, making their list of tasks that go along with doing the dishes Mm -hmm. and then saying, can you check my work? How do you feel about this? And creating a minimum standard of care, which is again, that sort of vocab word from fair play. Well, and that Um, also, it it requires a little bit of, (laughs) we're a lot of bit, I was trying to be gentle, ego strength to get feedback, to say, you know what? Thanks for your effort. And that's not good enough. Or here's where I need more. And if, if you're in a pattern of, you know, cycles of reactivity or disharmony or resentment, it's going to be even hard to hear that feedback. Uh, this is, you know, thanks for the start, but there's more work you got to do here. I could see some people being like, well, fuck that. Look, you know, like, isn't this enough yet? Yeah. So this is where we really have to remember we're on the same team. We're trying to create more ease and peace and connection so that there's not a buildup of resentment and disconnection. Yeah, and I think a lot of times we're looking for ways to help guys lean into it because you know, right now, for the most part, most guys are really benefiting from the system where um, a lot of women are judged for being responsible societally for the cleanliness of the house and how things pre- are presented. Um, and so to, I think the, the lean-in opportunity here for a lot of guys is – they don't like being nagged. They don't like being told what to do. So if you are actually able to create a minimum standard of care on things where you guys have bartered, you've agreed on things. Like when we were first, like it was a 45 minute conversation last year, I think about how we wanted the trash to be taken out, which (laughs) sounds absurd for it to go that long. Cause you would think it's simple, but all those minuscule things of like, okay, um, you know, if it's snowing out and I don't feel like putting my snowshoes on, do you mind if I leave the bag right next to the door on the outside on like our back porch? Um, or do I really need to bring it over into the pill? Like, can we not be mad at that? Okay. If, if we do put it out there and it snowed, how much time can elapse until like it needs to go in there? Do we just wait for the next bag of trash or is it like a, one day minimum or is it just if we start to smell it um (laughs) there's so many minuscule parts of that that once you can agree on them there really is no nagging but and i don't even like the word nagging but i think you can then be holding them to their own word so i Mm -hmm. think a lot of times when guys hear that they're being nagged it's because it's not the standard of care they agreed upon is the standard of care that she is often most comfortable with and feels is important and he has not gotten on board with the that level of importance and understanding of why that's important to her what what happens in that scenario and i know we'll have room for questions at the end where what if he can't buy into the importance of that what if he's like that's like way too much have you had that conversation with any uh, of the couples or you know Because that's assuming that one person's standard of care is the priority, whereas the others may not have as much input. What I would probably, I, I, so I have not come across that yet. And my gut reaction is if, if it's really that important that it's that level of care, let's say for Alyssa, but like, I just can't wrap my head around the understanding of that. then it's probably something that she should own completely. Um, now hopefully that you're not coming into that problem with a lot of cards, 
hopefully it's just a couple that are really important um, such that you can't agree upon the standard of care. Um, but I, you know, I, I could be very uh, jaded or, or biased because the guys that I work with signed up with me and they are leaned in, but I, right. I really feel like uh, from the amount of DMS that I've gotten from guys thanking me for um, the the videos that I put out there, that they've been able to improve their relationships just based off of free content on TikTok and Instagram. Um, I think there are a lot of guys that are leaned in that, or, or maybe they're just like, they're disenfranchised from it, but like we can, they're corralable. Um, yeah. And it, sometimes I, I hate that sometimes it takes um, uh, another guy's voice to penetrate their ego or something. Um, but yeah, I, I really think there's more guys out there that are, are capable of leaning in than we think. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll just, you know, throw up this example in my own relationship. I happen to like a really clean kitchen and crumbs just like drive me up a wall. And my partner, we don't live together, but we mostly spend our time here when we are together. He really could care less about crumbs. But it's not that he doesn't care about cleanliness. He doesn't have great eyesight. So he actually can't see it. And I have a black countertop. So he often actually can't see what's there. And if I were to criticize you to clean up after yourself, you know, that's different than, hey, babe, I did the best I could. If I, I may not have caught everything because I didn't see it all. Right. And so he recognizes that me wanting a clean kitchen isn't just about me being a nag or me being controlling or it, it's a. No, help, let me help you understand when my, my kitchen is clean, I feel more relaxed and calm and peaceful. When it's messy, I get like anxious and a little dysregulated. And that's one less thing that I will have to attend to that helps me in having a full day long of clients or being present for my kids. So while he doesn't hold the same value of it, he respects what it means to me very well knowing, hey, hon, I'm not going to be perfect at this, but please know that I'm trying. And that's yeah, and almost enough, right? Like if he can do 80% of it with the best effort knowing I'm okay coming into that last little bit and feeling like I'm not carrying the full load there, but I'm not asking him to care about it. I'm asking him to respect that I care about it. Mm -hmm. That's really well put. I, and I honest that that's almost an exact conversation that I had with Alyssa when we, when she, when we we're both on paternity, maternity leave was the kitchen counter was like, a huge source of anxiety and anything else in the apartment. There could be tons of clothes and crap on the couch. There could be boxes lining the edges of the kitchen on the floor. But as long as the kitchen counter is clean, like there was room to breathe. And yeah. I think she did a good job communicating that with me. We didn't have the words of fair play yet at the time, but I think she did a really good job explaining and helping me understand um, the level of anxiety she gets from that specific thing. And I think it took an intentional conversation with well, what, what are the specific things that are really bring you that anxiety that like, I think I had asked her like an 80, 20, like Pareto principle question of like, if, if you were coming home and the whole apartment's a mess, what's the top two things that are going to give you less anxiety when you walk in? And she was like, countertops and countertops maybe maybe <laughs> the dishes are thick um and so I, I think that was really powerful when she shared those things with me and we came to that yeah yeah um I want to get to unicorn space next which is part of the fair play method so unicorn space I would almost bet you guys listening can intuitively figure out what that might mean uh, for me, that is making content. It is building my coaching business. It is uh, working on building the path out back to make it to our pond. Um, to make it easier to get on... the garbage out in the snow. <laughs> I, that is not part of my unicorn space. Um, it is working on the, the book that I'm currently working on the proposal for. Um, and it's probably maybe doing a little bit of woodworking around the house. Um, for her, it is gardening. 
for her, it has been taking care of her, being with horses, being with our three goats in the backyard. Um, she's currently working on learning to grow mushrooms. Uh, so doing that, um, taking care of our dog and no, that's not unicorn space. That's, that's something else. Um, I think she has one more. I think those are, those are the main ones for us. So what that typically looks like is something that you gather energy from, from doing, um, that is an expression of yourself. That is typically something that you've really enjoyed and appreciated before, mm. uh, coming into a, a marriage or becoming a parent. Um, and the reason I think it's really important for us to embrace unicorn space, especially after kids is because it's really easy for that to default, um, out of our lives. And I think a lot of mothers are saying that I, I don't know myself anymore. I've gotten completely lost in motherhood real quick, just to raise a hand to who in here is a mother. So I can be making sure that I'm, I'm sharing my messaging appropriately with this crowd. Uh, one, we got two. Are there more? I, I can't tell from uh, my view. There are more, but people aren't raising okay. their hands. But I also okay. know that there are some who are not. So we can speak to both of those things. But I, sure. I, I do know with many clients that I work with that we can also lose ourselves in other areas of our life, even being a caregiver to an elderly parent or being over consumed by work. So I think even if it's not just in our motherhood, there's a lot of places in which women feel like, I, I don't even know who I am outside of what I've been doing all this time. Mm. And yeah, and so part of the reason that I think it's important, so if a, if a couple's not ready to talk about fair play and in trading and in creating equitable uh, division of labor in the home, I think the value of talking about unicorn space is, I bring up this metaphor a lot, which is a lot of us really like the idea of budgeting. It's a great idea. I think uh, everyone could probably agree on that. However, most of us probably don't do it to the level of its highest utility. And so it falls to the wayside. But I know personally in, in our lives, we always get back to budgeting when we're either in some crappy debt when we are uh, trying to save up for a house, a car, a vacation, um, or, or like a big ticket item, like a new computer or something, we really lean into budgeting when that happens. And so I see budgeting is the non-sexy, like really useful thing, similar to the fair play method. I think probably both parties, even the party that's like um, getting more of their needs met, typically the, the woman, um, probably agrees fair play is not like a, a fun activity all all that it has good um, results but not fun unicorn space is typically the thing that we're saving up for the thing that we really want that we have now have space for because we're doing some of the hard work mm -hmm. so if we are embracing unicorn space if we are saying look uh, you know I, I would really like to get back to those pottery classes that I was taking however um, Sunday's the only day that it's offered and our house is always a disaster and you're always out golfing Saturday. So Sunday I always end up cleaning the house and the only way I can get back to, I think having that part of myself is by going back to that. And, and I really need you to lean into helping out around things. Uh, can we have a conversation about that? And especially if, you know, I, I think a really good leverage point that I've talked with for people on one-on-one on -on -one calls is a lot of women that I'm talking with, they're like, yeah, all the time he always says like, yeah, I would love to see you going to the gym more because I know that brings you a ton of energy and like I miss that about you. I would love to see you working on X, Y, and Z. And that's the moment where you can be saying, look, like I know you want to see me back in that because I, and I would I love that too. However, I'm unwilling to let the responsibilities with the household slip so that I can do those things. Can you help me out with those things? It's like it's a leverage point for that conversation. Oh, I just talked a lot. Is that, is that making <laughs> yeah. sense at the moment? Yeah. And I, I think in the recognition as well, one of the things that I talk a lot about in couples work is reciprocity of need. 
And so if I see a need in my partner and I can step towards and meet that need, then they're more likely to meet my need in return. And it's not always going to be a one-to-one ratio. It, you know, sometimes is stepping, you know, extra towards. And when we can support our partners to be the best version of ourselves, then we show up better for our partners, you know? And so the leverage is a happy partner will make you happy, right? If you, if your wife is stuck cleaning the house on Sundays, can't go to pottery because you've been out golfing all day Saturday, it's likely going to make her resent you a little bit. Well, how come he got to go do that? And I'm stuck here doing this. It's likely to make her, you know, maybe perhaps more irritable or passive aggressive, or maybe a little bit less available for sex when you want to lean in for sex, right? I mean, like, these are the very real currencies of relationship. And to be able to support your partner and being the best version of themselves, not only for themselves, but also for what you're going to get back in return, you're going to get a better partner. Mm -hmm. Uh, I sometimes I forget to sex is a super important piece that I don't bring up a whole lot because like I have to watch my language on TikTok and Instagram and stuff but but yeah I I think that's another honest leverage point for a lot of guys that really crave that and are not having the level of physical intimacy that they want is probably very correlative, I won't say causation, but very correlative to the amount that they're leaned in when it comes to domestic labor. Yeah, I know we have about four minutes left until um, until the Q&A. So I want to fit in. Yeah, please. Uh, I want to share two, two last tools that I'm consistently sharing with my clients to practice using. And we can First be one, flexible on that end time, Zach. So go through your two tools sure. and we'll use the rest for Q&A. Okay. Uh, so the two main things that I consistently in teaching and practicing with my clients, I, I do role plays on the calls with them, is mindful reactions and breaking the fourth wall. Mm-hmm. I think I'm actually going to go with breaking the fourth wall first. If you know what that means, this this should be really easy, but uh, I've done it a lot in sales calls and I've realized the value in breaking down barriers with people that you're either strangers with or that you currently have a wall up with. So the idea is, let's say um, I'm working on listening to you and I'm fumbling. Jory, I really understand that, you know, you feel um, upset about this. And no, Zach, I'm not upset about this. I'm sorry. This is something I've really been trying to work on. And please just give me a couple tries to to get this right. I I really want to make sure you feel heard. Um, And so do you mind if I try that again? So there's this moment of like, they're, they're calling out the fact that they're trying, they're calling out the fact that they're getting it wrong, but they're trying. And Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a lot of vulnerability in sharing Mm -hmm. that. And so I think it softens up the recipient of whoever's being spoken with. And all the time I say, use me as the fourth wall, like, Hey, there's this thing that, you know, I've been working with Zach, like, there's this thing we've been working on. Do you mind if like I fumble this a couple of times, like I'm, I'm doing my best here. Um, and I think it's rare that there's a woman out there that has their husband working with me that isn't somewhat pleased with the fact that they've reached out to me and are working with me. Um, so I, I think every time they use that, they're like, oh, good. I get to see what this coaching really looks like. Um, and like, I, I think you can do the same thing with if you watched say a video from any influencer, any content creator that's trying to teach you a new method of communicating, like go back to, Hey, sorry, I I fumbled that one. I'm trying to implement this new thing I saw on Instagram today. Do you mind if I try that again? Um, So that's the first one, breaking the fourth wall. I love that. Thank you. Uh, The second one is mindful reactions. So oftentimes uh, those discussions are consistently happening they have a very similar trigger they have a similar response and rabbit hole that they that we go down so what i'm constantly listening to is if my client comes to call hey we had this shitty conversation the other day i'd really like to break that down great let's do it what was the thing that they said and what was the first i'm listening for and i'm going to force them to figure out What's the first like verbal cue that popped up in your head that that you could predict you're about to head in a similar place that you've gone before? 
Mm. And so I know one of the one uh, I'm sure there's synonym phrases to it, but here we go again is mm-hmm. is a typical one that I've heard. Um, so the moment that you this hear, again? <laughs> yeah, anytime there's the word again, probably. Yeah. Whenever you are hearing yourself say that, I want you to start noticing it. So start building some awareness. And secondly, when that happens, I'll I'll say, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to imagine that moment. Where in your body are you feeling that reaction? Uh, it's often like tightness in their chest, uh, like a, a gut like drop. Um, maybe I know for me, like my ears get really hot and like physically red. Um, I don't know about Some the people part, get but... that kind of um, lump in their throat when they can't speak their truth and they feel like, you know, mm. so I hear that from reason... a lot of clients. Yeah, the the reason that I really try to call those out, and you guys can be checking in with your bodies right now, thinking about what's that reoccurring thing that happens with my partner, is when you can identify what's that first trigger word in my brain, what's that feeling in my body, you can start identifying it and making new changes. For example, mm-hmm. so a metaphor sort of that I shared the other day was that um, you currently have directions to go places, which you typically go to. And maybe you just keep taking the wrong turn at the same intersection every time. So what happens is all the lights look the same and you just keep going straight and straight and straight and you miss your left turn, which is you listening to your partner effectively. So listening for that thought, listening for where in your body you feel that, or pointing out, hey, there's a 7-Eleven at that stop and there's a giant, like ugly yellow house at that intersection. That's where you turn left. Um, And so it gives us an opportunity to have a louder moment, like internally, where we are noticing a trigger response, and then we're much more able to have that mindful um, internal reaction, like, oh, shit, I'm doing it again. Here's my opportunity to do something new. And I often I recommend, and then include breaking the fourth wall, is like, honey, I'm recognizing I'm having a reaction right now. I really want to listen to you. Can you just give me a moment? Because I don't want to go down the path that we typically go. And I've I've heard it work at least a handful of times. I know it's worked significantly for us. I know for for me and Alyssa, sometimes I will say something similar to that. I'll be like, I'm really afraid that I'm going to say something really dumb in the next like two minutes. Would you allow me to go clean some dishes or do something, (laughs) some menial task, come back and, and reset the emotion of this conversation. I know I need to apologize and my ego is not giving it to you right now. And I need to, I need to step away for a minute. And I can recall two conversations in the past, like nine months, but that's been really significant, changing the tone of the conversation and acknowledging Mm -hmm. where I want to be versus where I am emotionally in that moment. Um, I think it's a, it's a really good practice. So those are my main two tools. I I love that. And I'm just going to add on a little bit to one of them, or actually a little bit to both just to kind of wrap it up, you know, the acknowledgement of, Hey, I'm trying, can I try this again? I really invite, if your partner has the vulnerability and awareness to say that to you, receive it with compassion. Cause I work with a lot of couples that, can get frustrated again like you 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 know like can't you get it right and continue to kind of criticize the moment versus recognize the intention and you know part of this is work I do with couples is assume positive intent right like let's assume we're on the same team let's assume we want to make each other feel good let's assume I don't want to fight tonight let's assume you know that I want to hear you, right? And so whatever is coming up might be one of those barriers in the way in that moment. And sometimes that's just old shit. That's not even about our relationship, right? The ego stuff, the wounds, the traumas, whatever it is. And to bring this into real example in another way is um, sometimes when John and I get in a disconnection and I'm really seeking an apology, he can say the word, but the tone and the body language and the energy, this doesn't feel quite, apologetic in the way that would make me feel really seen or heard or validated. 
and I've had to learn and he's had to teach me and say, when he, he'll say, this is me trying, I can come back again later with a better apology. But if you can accept this first step, that will help calm down my nervous system, which will give me the ability to come back and say it in the way that you need to hear it. Because when I would respond, I'd be like, that's not an apology. Well, that would defeat his own effort mm -hmm. to step towards me. So for me to receive with compassion, the first step, knowing there will be more steps, but I need to be patient and do some like my own regulating in the moment, right? So that's just kind of adding on to that. And those mindful reactions, I mean, that's exactly the focus of what I teach is the awareness. Like what, what are my thoughts? What are my emotions? What are the sensations in my body? And to tune into the somatic, we don't often have the language to put to the emotion we're feeling, but we know what our body's feeling. And those physiological responses are automatic from our thoughts and our emotions. So I love that you named the somatics there because that's a really key piece in being able to get to know ourselves and being able to then communicate more effectively. So Zach, I love all this. I, I think you're doing great work. I know that, you know, I'm going to generalize and say there's a lot of wives out there who are really happy you're doing the work you're doing. And, you know, like you said, you're, you're probably getting the guys who are ready and available to lean in and don't discount the amount of guys who want to lean in, who just aren't ready yet. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it's making an impact no matter what. And I, I will say something interesting. So, I mean, most people could probably imagine just from hearing me right here that 93% of my audience is women. Um, and I realized that, you know, between the two platforms, I'm about 470,000 followers for the, for months, maybe over a year, I, I had it in my head that, oh, it's just an all woman audience. And if I think about it, okay, actually, 7% of them are men and 7% of, of 470,000 is not a small number. So there's thousands of men that are leaned in. And I think there's, there's a reoccurring like stigma or like idea out there that men just don't care and they're not interested. Like there are thousands of men that care. There's probably millions out there that haven't seen my stuff yet or aren't quite ready for it, but they probably could emotionally be there very soon. So like, I, I, if you guys, if you are struggling in a relationship right now, I highly encourage you to consider the men care. Yeah. I love that. Let's open up to some questions. I know we've got, you know, almost a, a dozen people here. There, there's a lot that could spark some insight or curiosity. So if you've got a question, if you're here on a live call, um, Matt, turn on your microphone. Okay, hang on. Let me get my video on. Ah, uh, Matt, Hi. So good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too, Jory. Uh, Zach, thank you. This is amazing. I'm really, I'm intrigued. I have a question for you, Zach, and I'm also interested to hear, Jory, what your opinion is about how couples negotiate couple time versus alone time and how you sort of move into and out of that dance without rejection. Um, so much of what you're talking about is about actively having conversations mm -hmm. about partnership. And a big part of partnership is about not always spending all your time together and how to signal that to each other and move into and out of that dance without it being rejecting. I would just be curious about Zach, starting with you and Jory, of course, you know, I'm a big fan. So anything you have to say is, is gold to me. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, well, well, thank you for the question, Matt. Uh, I guess I would start with, so that, so let me reiterate the question. So the question is how to go about having a conversation about wanting alone time versus wanting couple time. I'm assuming when you're probably in a similar space or you're in the same house. Um, what I would probably say is if things are not defaulting the way you want, uh, for example, in 2014, I took on this leadership course um, and all of a sudden, all the default time that Alyssa and I were just in the same space and enjoying each other evaporated almost overnight when I started the course. And it led to problems almost immediately. Like, she's like, damn, I haven't seen you all week. I only feel you when like you cuddle up next to me in bed at night. Um, and so what we recognize is we need to start scheduling that like, okay. Thursday's date night, like make sure you're 
you're coming home, you know, by seven o'clock so we can at least eat dinner together. Um, so similarly, it sounds almost like if you're having too much time together and you recognize that you need more like individual time, I would say similar, like, look, you know, ever since COVID, we, we both work remotely. We share the same space. Like I see you all fucking day. I love you. And that's just, it's a lot. Um, start scheduling alone time and recognizing what is it that's going to fill your cup and what, what are your needs and, and create that, create a positive and healthy boundary. And if they're, if they're having a hard time hearing that, and I think that's what you were saying about how, like, how do you not hurt the person or how do they not fight back against that? Um, I think if you can really share and help them understand how important it is, especially like if you're an introvert or something, I'm an extrovert. So that I don't, I definitely don't feel this pain. I want to be around people a hundred percent of the time almost, but um, I think if you can help them appreciate your experience uh, around needing alone time, if they're a good partner, I, I think they'll listen or they can come around or they can hear that it might take some adjustment in, in the experience there, but I think they should be able to hear that. Jory, I'm going to hand this one off. To yeah. You. I've, Matt, I could make an entire um, hour long conversation about this. So I'm going to be brief. Um, I will say part of my answer is if you haven't already check out my podcast episode that came out last week with Terry Real, who is, you know, one of the top two therapists in the country right now. He wrote the book Us on becoming more relational. And I had the pleasure of meeting Terry in person in Vancouver at a conference back in April. And sorry, dog barking. And um, I had asked Terry the question of balancing my independence and my relationship, because this was an issue of what led John to breaking up with me was he believed I was valuing my independence over partnership. And that independence that I was needing my, my alone time was based on me healing some past traumas and past issues that came completely ever before John. So while I was really proud of myself for my independence, it was hurting my partner. And I'm just going to tell the difference. Oh, Jory, you think tell me you need your here? independence. Yes. <laughs> um, so what I asked Terry Real was, how do you balance this? And what he said was, a really healthy partnership strengthens the individual. If we focus too much on our individuality, it threatens the partnership. And so kind of doing a turnaround there of, if I seek more time with my partner, I will be able to get some more of my own time for what I need. And if I'm putting my time and attention into the relationship first, then there will be more room left over for what my needs are. Because if his needs aren't being met, then our relational needs are not being met. And that's going to cause a breakdown, which it did. It wasn't the only cause of our relationship um, ending temporarily, but it was a factor in that. So I asked Terry about that again on the podcast. So he does mention that um, in that episode. The other piece of it is um, when it comes to the feeling of rejection and is this an opportunity for the partner who feels rejected to practice self-regulation, right? Like what's coming up for them in that, how are they interpreting this action of your alone time as rejection? That likely is again, a result of something in the past or early on in the relationship that's been unresolved. And there's a time in relationship where we co-regulate one another, which we're there to support and help, you know, quiet the nervous system. And there's times when that's an individual job. And I'm someone who likes co-regulation. So when I felt rejected when John needed a load time, even if that was after a heated argument and he needed space and that felt really dysregulating for me, it was like, okay, I'm noticing I'm feeling rejected. This actually isn't rejection. I'm interpreting this as rejection. There's a story I'm telling myself here. What can I do to calm myself down, to regulate my nervous system, to quiet my thoughts? And to do my own work around this and to not make my unresolved work a relationship issue, 
So that way we can actually attend to the real relationship issue in the relationship. So Matt, I hope I answered your question because there's so much I could say there. And I hope my dog barking wasn't too much of a distraction. Um, but I think it's a really, really common challenge among partners and especially at different stages and ages of your marriage and parenthood journey, right? If you're new parents, there's going to be very little time for a lot of independence without some resentment. If you're empty nesters, well, now we've got all this time. How do I balance that, right? So also recognize different ages and stages is going to come with different expectations, perhaps. And one of the quickest paths to suffering is expectations. So if they're not being communicated, then that becomes a bigger problem. So Matt, I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank uh, you both. Uh, any other quick questions before we wrap up? This of course will be um, sent out for the replay tomorrow morning. My guess is there might be some people who are like, I listened to this recording last night and hey honey, <laughs> you need to come listen to this with me. So. I imagine that there might be some partners listening in on the recording after it's sent out because this really is valuable tool. So Zach, thank you so much for the work you're doing for being part of the virtual retreat, for sharing with your community. And, you know, it's it's really an amazing thing from a therapeutic standpoint to have language to put to some of these challenges that couples, because sometimes just having the right word to name it helps us deal with it differently and mm -hmm. so you know using words like fair play or mental load or unicorn space language is important and having clear language to know what i'm talking about what you're talking about we can come together makes it even just a little bit easier so yeah and i'll, I'll double in on the ideas I, I think one of my more recent video from last month was talking about like the five words that you need to start knowing and using like regularly in your relationship um, and I think mental load was probably my top one. Emotional labor. Um, honestly, I'm forgetting the other four. I did the research on it back then. But but I think being able to like articulate your issues, uh, a minimum standard of care was one of them. Um, yeah. Being able to articulate things, uh, I know is huge. Oh, decision fatigue was one. But mm. I all the time I get DMs from people saying how important the videos have been that I've been making because they haven't the, like all the time I get the comment, like, why am I crying right now? They don't understand like why they're having an emotional response. And I say after enough DMS with people like trying to figure that out, I've realized it's because you feel heard in a way that you thought you were going crazy and you had no yeah. way to articulate before until you heard the words put this way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank you so much for your time and for all you guys who are listening live and in, in the replay um, tomorrow, we've got Rob Mack, who is a friend of mine who's been on the podcast many times and kind of backed by popular demand to have Rob around. He's a happiness coach and so inspiring. And so be sure to tune into that on Thursday and then Friday, I will be interweaving all of the wisdom together of the week and having a celebration of our virtual retreat. So be sure not to miss Friday as well. And um, thanks you guys for showing up. I hope you took this valuable information as ways that we can cultivate satisfaction at any time. And, you know, it's, it's okay to do the work. Even though even the word work has a negative connotation, right? We're working towards better partnership, better connection, better intimacy, better vulnerability, all the things. So it's okay to do the actual work. And if I could uh, just do a self plug real quick, um, please. Uh, if I I'm not sure where uh, the freebie, the mental load one on one has been put. I'm sure in one of their emails or something. But yep. uh, that email went out on Monday. That. I'll put it again in tomorrow. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so that document is a culmination of the FAQs I currently get, which is how do I get this on my husband's for you page? Um, how do I <laughs> talk to him about this conversation starters, as well as like a surface level under um, explanation of how to talk about it with them um, and sort of putting it in their own terms. And secondly, um, if working with me, if, you know, you, you don't need a therapist, but you need a coach to help you stay accountable to having these uh, tough conversations. That's more, most of what I do. 
Um, if you go to my Instagram or my TikTok, Zach Thinkshare or real Zach Thinkshare on Instagram, um, you can find uh, in, in the link there is uh, you can book a relationship goals consult. It's a 45 minute call. I listen to you and see if it might be a good idea for us to work together. Perfect. I'm glad that you shared all of those resources. And I will also in the email going out with the replay, send the PDF of the fair play cards. So you guys can take a look at that as well. So, all right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you guys all for showing up. I really appreciate you all being here. Be well. Thanks, Jory.